In a recent technical interview, I was asked to debug the Redux effect for the lunar wane shaft on a turbo encabulator, but I failed because my asynchronous anonymous function abstraction was not idempotent or ephemeral and failed to memoize the predicate and serialize the output. It's one thing if your code doesn't work, but it's impossible to fix if you don't understand the words that describe the problem. When you learn to code, you not only have to learn a programming language, but also a bunch of fancy words that you would never use in a normal conversation. In today's video, we'll unpack and define a variety of different technical words that you'll definitely need to know for interviews and your day-to-day -day work as a programmer. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Work has been proceeding on the crudely conceived idea of an instrument that would not only provide inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal gram meters. Rockwell Automation's Retroencabulator. It's available soon wherever Rockwell Automation products are sold. Item potent. Item potent. The key part of this word is item, which is Latin for same. The word was coined in the 1800s in the context of mathematics, and it means an operation that when applied multiple times will always produce the same result. For example, multiplying by one multiple times always produces the same result. That's an item potent operation, unlike multiplying by two, which always produces a different result. Think of a crosswalk button. If you push it multiple times, does it go any faster? No, that's because it's an idempotent system. In programming, it means the same thing, an operation or function that can be called multiple times, creating the same output or side effect. For example, if we have an array and we push a new element to that array, it's making the array longer even if it's the same element, so that is not idempotent. If we use a set, on the other hand, we can run the same operation multiple times and it only keeps the unique element Therefore, adding an item to a set is idempotent. This term comes to play most often in the context of APIs. The HTTP verbs of get, put, and delete should always be implemented in an idempotent way. In addition, if you have an e-commerce app where a user can submit a payment, you likely want that operation to be idempotent as well, because posting the same form shouldn't result in multiple charges to that customer. Ephemeral, ephemeral. It comes from the Greek word ephemeros, which means lasting only a day. Think of an ephemeral plant like a daylily whose flowers only last for a day. In programming, it's an antonym for terms like persistent and immutable. At the hardware level, your RAM is ephemeral, while the hard disk is persistent. When you shut down your computer, any memory in the RAM is lost, while the data in the hard disk can be retrieved later. The term is also used to define data structures within our code. For example, a plain JavaScript object is considered ephemeral. That's because we can mutate its properties and have no way to get back to the original object. However, we can make it persistent or immutable, there's a bonus word for you, by calling object freeze, which will prevent any future modifications to the object. But the place you might hear ephemeral used most often is within the context of cloud computing. Many things in the cloud are becoming serverless. Instead of a persistent server always running in the cloud, we can use ephemeral servers that only run when they're needed. You probably know these as AWS Lambda or Google Cloud functions. You might also see the term used with IP addresses. An ephemeral IP is one that is reassigned after a server shuts down. Anonymous. Anonymous. First and foremost, the word is used to describe a global group of hacktivists that fight against things like censorship and big government. I would highly recommend that you sign up and put that on your resume today. But the word anonymous is also used in our code, primarily to define functions that don't have a name. Take for example a JavaScript function, or a Python function if you prefer, that takes an argument and multiplies it by two. What we have here is a named function, but it becomes cumbersome to pass named functions around everywhere, especially as your code grows in complexity. And that's where anonymous functions come in. They're just functions that don't have a name. Instead, the function is defined as the argument, therefore it doesn't need to be referenced by a name. In JavaScript, we can use an anonymous function with the arrow syntax, but many other languages, like Python, use the lambda keyword to define an anonymous function. The syntax feels a little weird at first, but it's incredibly useful for small, simple functions as arguments. Now speaking of functions, that brings us to our next fancy word, predicate. The word has its roots in Latin for something declared or proclaimed. In programming, it most often means a function that returns a single Boolean value, true or false. By convention, you'll often see these functions start with the word is. Is the value a turkey? It's a simple yes or no question, so we can return a Boolean. You might see the word predicate come up more often in strongly typed languages like TypeScript. One cool thing we can do is set up type guards. Take for example this code where we have an interface of a dog that can bark and a cat that can meow. Then we have a function called makeSound that can take either a cat or a dog, a union type, as its argument. 
The problem with this code is that we don't know whether we have a cat or a dog in the function body. However, we can overcome this limitation by setting up a predicate function that checks whether or not the animal is a cat. If we then use the predicate or a type guard in our function body, TypeScript is smart enough to infer the types based on this condition. If it's a cat, we meow, otherwise it has to be a dog, in which case we bark. Memoization. Memoization. I'm not sure if this word means memo like a written message or memo like memory. And although it sounds like a scary word, it just means to cache the return value of a function. If you've ever used React, you might be familiar with the useMemo hook. It creates a memoized value by only rerunning the function when its dependencies change. The classic example is the Fibonacci sequence. Here we have a recursive function. This function works, but it needs to recompute the same values over and over again. We can optimize it by creating an empty object then when our function runs a computation, it will save the value in this object. That means when we encounter the same value again, we can use the value in memory instead of recomputing it multiple times. When you hear the word memoization, just think memorization of a return value from a function. Abstraction. Abstraction. This word is derived from the Latin abs, which means from, and trahir, which means draw, so it roughly translates to drawn from. In the most general sense, it's the process of hiding implementation details from the end user. Programming is like an onion. It's layer upon layer of abstractions. When you build an application, you're doing it on top of programming languages and APIs that sit on top of networks and hardware that sit on top of transistors and electricity and so on. As a programmer, you've likely heard the phrase, do not repeat yourself or write dry code. In this example, we have a shark and a tuna and both classes have the same implementation details for their swim method. Rather than duplicate this code for each class definition, we can create an abstract class called fish. The abstract keyword means this class will never be instantiated on its own because there is no such thing as a generic fish. Instead, it's used to hide implementation details that can be inherited from other classes, which we can do by extending them with the abstract class. And that's just one of many ways you can create an abstraction in your code. The word itself really just means to hide unnecessary implementation details. Serialization. Serialization. This word comes from the English word series, which is just a collection of items in a fixed order. In the programming world, there's all kinds of different languages and formats, and we often need to interop between these different tools. Java doesn't know how to understand PHP code, but what we can do is take code from either language and serialize it into a format that they both understand, like binary. Then it can be deserialized back into code that can be used natively. Take for example a JavaScript app and a Python app that communicate over an API. We have a JavaScript object that we want to use in our Python app as a dictionary. Before we send the object from JavaScript, we serialize it as a string. JSON is a standard format that can be understood by virtually all modern languages. That's how we serialize a JavaScript object. Then we can go back into our Python code and deserialize it by using JSON loads. The bottom line here is that serialization is the process of taking data from one format and converting it to a more generic form that can be used by other programs. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. The lineup consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins, so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented.